Thanks, Dan. This coming Wednesday, we'll have a special exorcism service for the sound system. <laughs> D, go ahead and jump to the, the trivia slide there for me. I got some trivia questions for you this morning, and uh, you, can, you can read them. And if you're, really, if you're really brave, go ahead and yell out the answers. Um, if you're not that brave, you can just think of it in your head. What was John the Baptist known to eat? Locusts and honey, sure. Let's see. Ooh. Good. Matthew 3, 4. I think we got four questions up here. Four trivia questions for us to play along. You can actually play along on your device if you have your device. But who was the prophet of Israel in the time of Saul? Samuel. Samuel. Let's see. It's a little nerve-wracking, right? You say Samuel and then you second-guess yourself. Uh, yeah, it was Samuel. Next one. Next bit of trivia. What was the name of Elimelech's wife? A little bit harder one. Anybody want everybody brave enough to yell at this one? Orpah. Orpah. Orpah? Maybe by by yeah. elimination, right? Yeah. Oh no, it was Naomi. Naomi. There. One more. How did Joshua spies escape Jericho after the gates have been locked for the night? You just say A, B, C, or D? B. B. Let's see if we got that one right. B. There we go. So there we go. We did some, some trivia this morning, some Bible trivia there. Now, I, I did that for, for a reason, um, not just because it's fun, but because um, Bible knowledge is good. It's good to know things about the Bible. In fact, it's essential to know things about the Bible. In order to understand who God is, we need to understand, we need to understand the Bible. We need to understand the Scriptures. We need to understand what He says to us and who He is and what He's done and what His plan is. It's essential to knowing God and living out our faith. I think yeah, it is supposed to be going, but it's not. Yeah. Gremlins everywhere, I tell you. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Somebody's electromagnetically charged here in the front row. <laughs> Yeah. Have, to go yeah. Back to the have to go back to the edges. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I also feel like this is cutting out a little bit, but yeah. Turn it off and on again. That's the extent of my There we go. Biblical knowledge is essential. It leads us to knowing God. But there's a difference between Bible trivia and actually understanding God with a deep piece of knowledge. There's a difference between knowing things about the Bible, knowing things about God, and knowing God. And so, and so my question this morning, as we look at the 144,000 Revelation, as we understand what it says in, in Revelation chapter 7, is are we in danger of making the Bible just trivia? where we can answer the questions, where we know what it says, where it connects, we don't quite grasp what's going on. Because when we make the Bible just trivia, we cheapen it. We cheapen it incredibly in a lot of ways. And we miss the hard truths. Because the Bible is full of truth about life and about death. About truth itself about eternity, about righteousness, about how we should live our lives on this earth, about what our hope is after this earth, about what the world really is and what the world's really like. And so, one of the questions that, that really came to me today was, not today, um, I, I wrote the sermon before today, I swear. <laughs> One of the questions that came to me this week was why are we studying Revelation? Why study the book of Revelation? I mean, it's an incredibly interesting book. But why are we studying the book of Revelation? Well, it's not just to figure out trivia. In fact, it's not to figure out trivia at all. It's not to decode a puzzle. It's not to try to predict the future. It's not to try to cram the Bible into current events. But it's to hear the Word of the Lord. 
and to hear how God is equipping us to live in this world today. To fight the battle today. To hear what God's hope is for us tomorrow. See, the battle of faith is not, is not something that's coming. It's not something that's coming. The battle for your loyalty, the battle for your soul, the battle for your neighbor's soul and your, and your spouse's soul and your kid's soul and your, and your friend's soul is not something that's going to happen later. The battle for your faith and who you follow and your heart is not something that's going to happen later. It's something that's happening now. Right now, today, this very moment. It's not something that's going to go on later. The question where your loyalty lies is a question we need to answer today. And and when we just amass a whole bunch of trivia, we don't actually answer that question. Why don't we actually answer that question? We might know a lot of stuff about the Bible. We need to know God. We need to know who He is. We need to let His Word change our life. We need to let His Word change our mind, change our hearts, transform us. Right? It's not, we don't just come to church, we don't just read the Bible or listen to messages like Earl talked about this morning um, you know, to, to confirm what we already think. We come to God to be transformed. To transform what we think. To align it to the truth. To what's real. And then to live a transformed life. Because all that Bible trivia we did up there isn't going to help you in the battle for your loyalty. Because there's a battle today. Are you equipped for the battle? How are you equipped for the battle? How do you equip yourself for the battle? To know the truth. How are you equipped to know the truth? To know what's true and what's a lie. How are you equipped to know right from wrong? To know the voice of the true shepherd. How are you equipped for that? How are you equipped to discern it from the voice of the thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy? There's a battle today. There's a battle today for your loyalty. There's a battle today for your devotion. You need to see this. We need to understand this. We need to understand that we're in the midst of a battle. Right now, today. We need to understand that there's an enemy vying for your loyalty. That there's an enemy vying for your time. Vying for your focus. There's an enemy who seeks to keep you from being effective. Who seeks to keep you from experiencing joy. Who seeks to keep you from experiencing peace. Like we sang that song, people looking for answers when the answers are only found in God. And yet there's an enemy who seeks to take us away from the source of those answers. And often the, 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 the events of the world can seem so overwhelming. There's so much stuff going on. And you think, where is the world going? What is happening? And if you get stuck in the news cycle, the news cycle is trying to keep you in constant distraction and constant fear. And if all we know of the Bible is just trivia, and not as the Word of the living God that is powerful, that is true, that is transformative, we're going to struggle to see how God's plan is playing out. We're going to struggle to find the deep peace and the sure hope that God offers. We look around the world right now. We see a world that suppresses truth. That calls lies truth. That calls evil good. In a lot of ways. And yet, we're surprised then that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Paul says really clearly in Romans, 
The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And if the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven, then the question before us is the one that's at the very end of chapter 6. The last three words of chapter 6. Who can stand? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Who can stand? The answer comes in chapter 7. Those whom God has sealed. That's our proverb for this morning. For those sealed by the Lord, we have confidence to engage in the battle. Chapter 7, we have this scene. It's a... like in Revelation, all the scenes are, are amazing. They're fantastic. And so we have this scene. We've got four angels at four corners of the world. Now we know that the world isn't square. It's not a rectangle. None of those things. And then we know, that we know this is symbolic language to mean all of the world. They cover the whole earth. They, they're, they're taking care of the whole earth, right? When we talk about the four corners of the earth, we know that that's what they're talking about. They're holding back the four winds of the earth. And if we understand the four winds, these are, these are four winds that have power to harm the earth and the sea. Now just a chapter before, we saw four entities that were given power to harm the earth and the sea, weren't we? Right? So we have the four horsemen who were given power to harm the earth and the sea being held back by the four angels before they can go so God can seal His people. The angels hold them back so the servants of God can be sealed. So the big question, the, the million dollar question, I mean the, 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 the billion dollar question, I guess, with inflation, who are the 144,000? Who are these people? And whole books have been written on this. And so we're not going to figure it out to everybody's um, satisfaction this morning. Because there's whole, like I said, there's whole books written on it. It's been a topic that's been discussed, has a lot of different views, and it's got a lot of different views because, to be honest, it's a little confusing. It's a little confusing as to who they are. Who are they? What is the seal that they're given? Why are these tribes specifically chosen and others are left out? Why is the tribe of Levi in there? Where is the tribe of Dan? How come Judah is first on the list? Why is the tribe of Joseph in there? There's all kinds of questions that you can ask. How do they relate then to the great multitude that John sees after? And then I think the even more important question, what's the point? What's the point? Is this just another piece of trivia? that John thinks would be important for us to know that 12,000 people from the tribe of Issachar were sealed. Well, there's a couple of clues to help us understand the meaning and the overall meaning, I think. One, the people who are being sealed are described this way. This is in verse, um, where are we? Verse 4, verse 3. The ones who are being sealed are described as servants of our God. These are people who are already servants of God. These are people who are already in service to the Lord. And their sealing is a, um, is a proof of that. Their sealing is a proof of that. They do not become servants by being sealed, but the seal is a confirmation of who they already are and what they already are. And secondly, servants of our God. Servants is used a number of times in Revelation. The word servants is used a lot of times in Revelations. Every time it's used, everywhere it's used in the book of Revelation, it's used as those who have faith in Christ. Every single spot in the book of Revelation. And so what I see here, and like I said, your your mileage may vary, but what I see here is I see a picture of the entire family of God. Both Jew and Gentile. All the servants of God symbolically included in this number. Because as Paul says, all of Israel will be saved from the wrath of God. All those who have believing loyalty in Jesus Christ are sealed and can stand at the day of the Lord. And this has very close parallels to chapter 5. So in chapter 5, John hears about the Lion of Judah. Right? He's told about the Lion of Judah. He hears about the Lion of Judah. And then he looks and sees. What does he see? 
When he looks, what does he see? A lamb. So he's told, the Lion of Judah. And then he looks, and he sees a lamb. And here in chapter 7, he hears a number. And then he looks, and he sees a multitude that no one can number. Their different descriptions are symbols of the same family. Completeness in the family of God. All those sealed by the Lord. All those who have faith in Christ have confidence to engage in the battle. And the reason why I'm using so much battle language is when this type of numbering system is used throughout the Scriptures, and this type of numbering is used throughout the Scriptures quite a bit. So if you go back in the Old Testament, you have a whole bunch of these lists. You know, this many from this tribe, this many from this tribe. And, and famously, what book do you think has the most of these lists? Numbers, right? Yeah, where they number people, right? And so you have these lists of numbers where they number people. And the majority of the time these lists are used, they're used to number armies. They're used to number military strength. It's military imagery. We have more military imagery in the second half of the chapter where they're where they're clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And palm branches are a symbol of military victory, of conquest. Right? When Jesus goes in the triumphant entry, what do they take? They take palm branches and they lay them down on the ground as a symbol of the conquering king coming into the city. Palm branches are just another military symbol. And so we have this symbol of the people of God who are not just lambs sent to the slaughter but an army which advances the kingdom of the Lord. An army that defeats the enemy. An army which will not be overcome. We stand together in battle. Stand up and be counted. Stand up and be numbered. We stand together in this battle. We do not fight against flesh and blood. But as the Word says, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of heaven, uh, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But we are to go to battle. And, and sometimes people want to hear a sermon and they want, to, they want to listen to a sermon so they can get talking points to battle with the culture. Talking points to battle what's going on in culture. What we need is to be equipped to battle the enemy. To actually battle the enemy. What's happening in culture is a symptom of what's happening in the hearts of people. Right? Culture is made up by people. What's happening in culture is a symptom of what's happening in the hearts of people. What the enemy is doing in the hearts of people who are enslaved, who are held captive, who are in chains. Right? We, the famous song, Amazing Grace, and then Chris Tomlin came and he added a chorus to it, which made it better? I don't know, maybe. Um, some will say yes, some will say no. Um, Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. My chains are gone. No longer in bondage, no longer in captivity. This is what we fight for. This is what we battle for. And we have confidence to engage in the battle. Right? We can go and we can engage in the battle. And why do we have confidence to engage in the battle? Because we've been sealed by the Lord. We've been protected by God. When Dee and I got married, um, we, we had two songs. We had a song that, where we walked down the aisle too. And then we had a song where you, you leave, right? You know, you're the altar, and then you're done, and then you leave. So you got the two songs. And uh, one song was Hello by Lionel Richie. Anybody, everybody know that song? Hello by Lionel Richie, right? Yeah, great tune. That was supposed to be the one that we were walking to, like down the aisle, right? Because, I mean, if you know the lyrics of that song, it it's, it's fits. And then the one that we were supposed to be walking away from the altar was Signed, Sealed, and Delivered, right? We all know that song too, right? Signed, Sealed, and Delivered. 
I'm yours. Unfortunately, what happened is whoever was doing our music, and I don't remember who was doing our music, who was pressing play on the, at that time it was a CD player. Um, um, Hannah and Nadine, you'll remember those from your grandparents' house. Um, <laughs> that time it was a CD player. But I, I forget who, who was doing it, but they played them backwards. So walking down the aisle was signed, sealed, and delivered, and then walking away was Hello by Lionel Richie, which was kind of backwards. And it was kind of upside down. And yet, and yet it gives us a great illustration of what's going on here, of what God does with us. When we first come together to God, He seals us. He delivers us. Right? It's not once we're good. It's not once we get good enough. It's not once we're done. It's right at the outset, right at the beginning. God seals us. And then in the in the scriptures, I, I, felt, I felt all weird this week because I, I was at work this week and I had my ring. And, I, you know, you, you play with your ring, right? Everybody plays with their rings. What's the old joke about married men play with their rings? What are they doing? They're looking for the combination. Um, <laughs> but I was playing with my ring and I played it and I took it off and I put it on my desk. And then it was time to go and so I had to kind of get up and go really quick and I left my ring on my desk all weekend. And it felt weird, right? My, my hand felt very weird. Um, because the ring is a symbol, right? The, when, you go to, when you have a wedding and you seal the covenant with a ring, the ring is a symbol of the sealing of that covenant. Right? It's not just to remind me, although it is to remind me. And that was the reason why I felt kind of naked without it. Because it, it is to remind me. It's to remind me of the vows I've made. Remind me of the, of the promises that I made. But there's another reason for the ring. And it's to show others who I'm committed to. It's to show others of the vows and commitments that I've made. The, revela- the, the 144,000 revelation are sealed where? On their foreheads. Right on their foreheads. For a couple reasons. There's a few reasons. One, the idea of being sealed on your forehead is a seal of ownership. It's a seal of ownership. Who do you belong to? Who owns you? To whom do we belong? Whose name is upon us? But it's also so that others can see who you are. That others can see who you belong to. Now obviously we don't have a physical mark on our foreheads, and so how do we show others who we belong to? How do we show others who our loyalty is to? By the way we live our lives, right? By our actions, by the choices we make. By what we do, by what we say. By how we live. By how we treat people. Bible trivia can't do that for you. Only the indwelling Holy Spirit does that. And so these 144,000 are sealed on their forehead. And what are they sealed with? Well, later on in Scripture, we see that they're sealed with the name of God. That they have the name of God written on their forehead. And if we back up to chapter 3, we see that those who conquer have the name of God written on their forehead. We also, if we go all the way back to Exodus, we see the commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Way more than saying OMG. What does it mean to take the name of the Lord? Well, it's the opposite of taking the mark of the beast. And you got one or the other. See, this seal contrasts the mark of the beast. Either you have the seal of the Spirit or you have the mark of the beast. And the question is all about who do you worship? Who do you follow? Who are you loyal to? And this is the reality. There's no middle path. There's no middle way. We either worship the one true God or we worship the beast. Christians who have loyalty to Jesus are sealed by the Spirit. We don't have to be afraid that we'll accidentally take the mark of the beast. I think I've said this before. 
right? Christians who have loyalty to Jesus, who believe in Christ, who have faith in Christ, will not get to the end of their life. And you know, the, I mean, it's, it doesn't actually, you know, the Bible doesn't actually have this, the pearly gates, and you see St. Peter there. That's not actually in the Bible, but let's use it for our purposes. You're not going to get to the pearly gates and see St. Peter, and St. Peter's going to say, well, I see here that you had devout faith in Christ, that you gave your life, as you gave your life in, in living sacrifice to Jesus, but, but, you use the fingerprint scanner on your iPhone. You're out. You got the mark of the beast. That won't happen. We're sealed by the Spirit. We are secured. We are assured. 2 Corinthians 1.22 God has put His seal on us and given us His Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Ephesians 1.13 When you heard the Word of truth, the Gospel, listen to this, when you heard the Word of truth and believed in Him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Not sometime later, not at the end of the ceremony, when you heard and you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Live up to the sealing that you have is what he's saying. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You are sealed by God. We are sealed how? By being washed in the blood. Right? John looks and he sees this multitude who are wearing these bright white robes and he asks the elder, and the elder asks him actually, like, do you know who these are? And, and John's like, well, you do. So how about you tell me? Right? And the, and the guy says, these are the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Anybody here do laundry? Anybody here try to get blood stains out of white clothes? Right? It's, it's, it's contradicting the idea, though, that Jesus' blood washes us clean. It's by the work of Jesus that buys our ownership. We're no longer slaves to sin. No longer dirty. No longer filthy. We've been redeemed. We've been purchased. Purchased at a price. By the blood of Jesus. And by it our sins are washed clean. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. You want to be washed clean? You want to be sealed for the day of redemption? You want to have the name of God on your forehead? You want the salvation that was purchased by Jesus on the cross? Then come to Christ. Come to Jesus. He's the only way. The only name by which you can be saved. Come to Jesus. This is our blessed hope. And it's this blessed hope that's this already and not yet that we have in the book of Revelation. This idea of the already and the not yet. We are already sealed by the Lord. Scripture is very clear. When you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. We were already sealed by God. And so sealed by the Lord, we have confidence to engage in the battle. You've been sealed by God and you've been counted into His army to go to battle. And you are not alone. You are with the entirety of God's people. The fullness and the wholeness of God's people. So we have this amazing picture of the church militant, the church at battle, the church at war, and then very closely after that, the church triumphant. The church militant and the church triumphant. While we are on earth here, we engage in the battle with the church militant. We stand against falsehoods. We stand against lies. We stand against the enemy. We stand for truth. We stand for Christ. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We stand together, sealed by God with His name upon us and His Spirit within us. And when we pass from this world, we join the church triumphant before the throne of God, washed clean by our loving Savior who gave His life so we could live. Jesus Himself will guide us to springs of living water. Jesus Himself will bring us home. 
And then it says, once we're home, the Father will wipe away every tear from your eye. Even if you give your life for the cause of Christ. And this is the thing. We're all expected to give our life for the cause of Christ. Are some of us going to die for our faith in the coming days, months, years? I don't know, maybe. Maybe we will. But regardless, we're to engage in the battle now. We're to give our lives now as living sacrifices because we're sealed now, we're secured now. Others need to hear the Gospel now. This is your story. This is not the story of somebody way in the future. This is your story. That God saved you. That God sealed you. That you will one day come through tribulation and stand before the throne of God. And you will wear pure white robes washed clean in the blood of Jesus. And you will always be praising and you will always be serving God. And no evil will touch you again. And God Himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And I think about that image and you think about the gentleness of that image. You think about the gentleness of the Father reaching down to wipe the tear from your eye. Who do we do that to? We do that to people we love. You don't go up to strangers in the street and start wiping their face, right? We do that to those we love. The gentleness of God. This is your story. What a hope we have in heaven. What a blessed assurance that we hold to now. That we're sealed by the Lord. We have confidence to engage in the battle. See, I don't see the end times as something that's going to start someday. Right? That, that someday I'll engage in the battle. Someday I'll fight back. Someday, after this happens or that happens or this happens, then we'll have to fight and we'll have to battle. But this is a reality today. And in God's grace, we are given peace right now here in Canada, here in the cusp. In God's grace, in God's amazing, marvelous grace, we live in a time and a place that we do now. Right? We are so blessed. So incredibly blessed. And so what are we doing with it? What are we doing with the blessing that God has given us to live in a time and place that we have now? Are we really going to wait until things get so bad before we act? Are we really going to wait for the beast with seven heads to come out of the sea? Before we tell people that Jesus is the only way? Before we love our neighbors? Before we walk in the way that God has us to walk? Before we dig into the Scriptures to know Him? Before we go past Bible trivia? Before we serve at the church? Before we give our lives as living sacrifices to God? Before we completely sell out for Jesus Christ? Of course not. Of course we won't. Of course we don't already. And if we only see Revelation and we only see the Bible as trivia or as somebody else's story, then we won't be ready to stand. We won't be effective in battle. We won't understand the seal that we possess that gives us assurance to live out our life of faith. Because what do we have to fear? What do we have to fear in this world? Anybody? That's right, nothing. Nothing to fear in this world. What shall we fear? 
We have the name of God on our foreheads. We have the seal of God protecting us. We are His, and He has called us into His service for the advancement of His kingdom. We're all going to go through tribulation. We're all going to go through hard times. We're going to go through tribulation of all kind, but we are sealed by the Spirit, and we are sent out into battle against the forces of evil, confident to engage, for we know that our God has already won the victory. Amen? This isn't somebody else's story. This is your story. This is our story. This is the story of every Christian. And it's so far from being mere trivia, it is a truth that should bring us to our knees in worship for the grace of God and bring us to our feet to stand in battle against those who would enslave our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You so much for Your grace to us. We thank You that You equip us with the power of the Holy Spirit that we may engage in the battle in whatever way You would have us engage. Lord, I pray that You would put that fire in our heart. Make us warriors for Your cause. Lord, warriors that would would go out and stand firm against evil, against lies, against anything that would set itself up against the truth of God. Lord, equip us with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that our only offensive weapon would be the Gospel. Lord, that as we change hearts, as You change hearts, and You change lives, that we would continue to labor in Your service, knowing that our hope is secure because You have sealed us. May You hold us firm in Your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.